Thank you, Varun. Uh, my name is Mayus Artyom, and I'm glad to be here with you today. So, uh, welcome to our webinar on creative accounting. Uh, we will discuss potential areas and some interesting uh, recent cases of creative accounting from uh, public companies. I'm broadcasting today from Dubai. Um, my, a little bit about me. Uh, my work experience is over 22 years, uh, and all of this experience is in the area of finance, in different areas of finance. Uh, I will just describe a little my experience uh, while everybody is joining us. Uh, so I'm an ACC qualified, uh, and one of the key areas of my expertise uh, lie, uh, lie in, the, in finance methodology for such uh, areas as financial and management reporting, budgeting and planning uh, in multiple IT softwares, including SAP, Oracle, IBM, and Anaplan products. Apart from automation, uh, I have been responsible as an accountant for issuance of several hundred financial statements for our various clients worldwide. Uh, my team, uh, has prepared the financial statements, both standalone and consolidated, under numerous reporting frameworks, including IFRS, US GAAP, Luxembourg GAAP, Dutch GAAP, and many other GAAPs. We have assisted as accountants uh, to a number of clients going public uh, on London and Moscow stock exchanges. So, I mostly speak on projects related, related to automation of finance, but this time I've decided to talk a little on accounting. Uh, to the outsiders, it seems one of the most boring professions. People mostly think that accountants mostly add and deduct, make double entries, debit, credit, a mostly dull, tedious job without much creativity. However, being in this profession for over 22 years, I would say that I've enjoyed it immensely. Of course, there is mostly no room for, let's say, glossy pictures of debits and credits, which you can post on Instagram or TikTok, uh, but the profession still has a huge amount of thought and creativity. But like in anything people do, uh, creativity has both bright and dark sides. And today we'll speak mostly on the dark side of accounting creativity or creativity which leads to accounting fraud or how it's sometimes called financial shenanigans. So on this page, uh, you can see a brief uh, plan of what I'm going to talk about for the next 40 to 45 minutes. I will talk a little about AZ, just a couple uh, minutes of advertising stuff on our company and projects. Uh, then we'll discuss the first case with inflated revenues of a public company, which when unveiled costed the investors several billion dollars. It's a case of luck in coffee. Then we have some theoretical stuff on the what creative accounting is and why it happens. And then we will move on to the next example of fraud with revenues, but using an example of an Australian-based company producing battleships for the United States Navy. Then again, we have some theoretical stuff uh, with, with overview of uh, fraud in financial statements and some examples for revenues and costs. And at the end of the webinar, we will briefly discuss uh, three more smaller cases with shenanigans related to uh, sales and consolidation. I very much hope that today's presentation will be interesting to you. I'm bringing to your attention the latest uh, actual cases, actual investigations uh, held by Security and Exchange Commission in the United States uh, in relation to the public companies. So let me introduce our firm, AD Professional Solutions. The firm started its operations in 2004 and now has offices in Russia and the Emirates. From the Emirates, we provide our services on automation of finance together 
with a consolidated network to the GCC uh, countries. In Russia, we are number two in terms of IFRS accounting and have more than 1,000 financial statements prepared and issued and over 25 finance automation projects completed with the clients located worldwide. We have a team of 50 professionals qualified as ACC, CFA, CFE, as well as multiple IT product certifications. And our key strength is that we are not only accountants, but we have a cross-functional team of accountants able to engage in complex IT implementation and as well with complex financial reporting projects. So mainly our role as methodology in finance automation projects lies in uh, preparing the, the architecture, architecture for implementation of automated financial reporting or budgeting. So if you think of automation as constructing a house, you will have the follows, following picture. The client is always a CFO and his team. The vendor is a supplier of material like IBM, SAP, or other. Uh, system as an integrator is a construction company, but ADE as a methodology consultants uh, perform a role of an architect. We go to the customer, talk to the CFO and his team, understand all his demands and requirements, and just prepare the blueprint uh, for the system to be implemented. So we have expertise by multiple vendors, uh, multiple industries, and we'll be really glad to share it with you. So this is all about uh, presentation about our firm, about our services, and let's start uh, with the first case of creative accounting I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this is quite a recent case uh, of uh, the company called Luckin Coffee. So let's talk uh, a little about uh, the history of the company. The company started its operations only in October 2017, and the company sells coffee, tea, and other stuff uh, to retail customers throughout China. The company grew so rapidly that by March 31st, 2019, it's already operated more than uh, 2,000 stores in 28 cities across China and had around 17 million customers and even surpassed Starbucks as the first coffee chain in China. Uh, by the end of 2019, the company claimed to have 40 million cumulative clients uh, in China. And to finance its tremendous and very rapid growth, Luckin Coffee made an IPO of its securities in the United States markets in May 2019, raising approximately 600 million United States dollars as, as a result of partial share, sale of its shares. In the months prior to the IPO, uh, various newspapers, various uh, analysts characterized the company's growth as meteoritic expansion uh, at breakneck speed. So the company valuation increased from uh, 1 million US dollars in July 2018 to almost 4 billion US dollars in May 2019, when the company actually went public. At the moment of an IPO, the company was loss making and didn't anticipate any break even in the nearest term. So all the focus was on rapid expansion of the business and uh, rapid growth of its uh, retail uh, stores and its, its, its revenues, its sales. So let's now uh, talk about how the company actually made revenues. So in order, uh, so the revenues were made in the following uh, uh, approach. So Luckin customers placed orders for Luckin products through the company's phone-based application. So all purchases should have been made through the application by redeeming coupons or using certain third-party-based systems like Alipay or WeChat. 
And the company recognized uh, the sales not when they sold the coupons, but when they actually, when the coupon was actually redeemed through the uh, company's phone-based application. As I said before, the trigger uh, for the company starting to apply creative accounting was the fact that all the company's valuation was based on very fast sales growth uh, of the company and the expectations which uh, the market, which the analysts had, and which was actually uh, a, base, a basic input in the company's huge valuation huge business valuation, multi-billion business valuation. So when the company's management started to understand that they couldn't uh, meet the expectations of the market, they started to think of creative accounting. And actually, uh, the company started to fabricate its sales uh, even one month prior to an IPO in April 2019, when, when it was claimed to beat um, Starbucks as the biggest uh, coffee network in China. So this is when the company started to fabricate the sales. And as uh, we can see later, the company had to fabricate almost half uh, of its sales in order to meet the analysts' targets. So the first, uh, there were three, three basic schemes uh, which the company used. So first of all, it was, it was the scheme with individual clients. So Luckin, a certain Luckin employees uh, made payments from their individual bank accounts to WeChat and Alipay accounts and purchased coupons on Luckin application. Then the employee made fake orders on Luckin application and real orders were never made. So this, is the this was uh, the first attempt. And the company was able to uh, inflate the revenues by several million dollars uh, using this, this, this approach. But then the management, management understood that uh, the company still couldn't make its sales targets. So they started to use corporate certain uh, related parties. So it was the same approach. Uh, the orders were made by related parties, uh, but actually never were never redeemed. These were fake orders. And the company was able to inflate uh, its earning, its revenues uh, by tens of millions of dollars. In order not to make it uh, very suspicious for the auditors, uh, because these are these were clearly related parties, the company used uh, the third uh, scheme. Uh, in this case, they used third-party shell companies, which were specifically created uh, for inflating the revenues. So they acted as a fictitious intermediary agents, uh, which then resold uh, coupons to individual customers. Uh, Luckin company's employees altered the company's bank statements so the revenues appeared to come from real rather than fake customers. And more of that, uh, the company's employees uh, created the whole uh, fake sales database and switched is as a source for the finance and accounting teams which, which uh, accounted for revenues. So th this was a huge amount, a huge amount of fraud, a, a huge case of fraud. So um, in 2019, in, in the last three quarters of 2019, uh, the company inflated its revenues using the three schemes I, I've told you about by almost 42% of total sales. It, it, the total amount of fabricated sales was more than 300 million US dollars. Uh, in the beginning of January 2020, they conducted uh, additional financing 
by equity offering and convertible bond issuance, bringing about 900 million US dollars of additional financing into the company. The company's share price uh, climbed to United States $50 per share uh, in January 2020, a nearly 200% increase from its IPO values. And analysts and all the analysts continue to issue positive reports and even increased their target prices for, for the company's stock. Uh, Lacking fraud came to light in early 2020 in the course of a routine annual external audit of the company's financial statements. And on April, in the beginning of April 2020, the company announced that it had fabricated over 300 million US dollars in the last three quarters of 2019. So within four days from this announcement, uh, the company's stock uh, dropped drastically, but more by more than 90% to $3, to a little higher than three uh, United States dollars per share. So this <clears throat> accounting uh, maneuvers, these accounting maneuvers, this accounting trick costed uh, the company's investors several billion of United States dollars. And the story actually uh, finished with the huge losses and further investigations, court proceedings, and criminal charges uh, issued to the company's employees. So on the, on the chart, you can see the drop uh, of the company's share price uh, when this actual, this actual fraud was announced. So you can see how much the company lost. And this is the copy uh, of the <clears throat> investigation order of the Securities and Exchange Commission of the United States uh, to the management of the company. So you can see uh, how huge uh, losses the company can uh, there when these accounting tricks are actually uh, found out. So now a little about theoretical stuff. So what is creative accounting? A legendary investor, Warren Buffett, uh, delivers its annual letter to shareholders in order to educate all interested parties about art of investing. In one such letter, the Oracle from Omaha gave a particularly important lesson about our today's topic, about companies that use the financial uh, tricks, they, that use the financial shenanigans in order to hide the unpleasant truth from the investors. This letter describes a conversation between a seriously ill patient and his doctor just after the X-ray revealed the bad news about his condition. Rather than accepting the diagnosis of deteriorating health, the patient immediately responded to the very bad, dreadful news, asking the doctor to simply touch up the, the, the X-rays, to, to actually fake uh, the X-rays. Buffett, uh, Warren Buffett uses the story to warn the investors about companies that try to hide the truth about their deteriorating business economic health by just touching up the financial statements. In the long run, uh, in the short run, they may probably solve some problems, but in the long, in the long run, uh, a lot of trouble awaits management that hides uh, their financial and operating problems uh, using accounting tricks. Eventually, management of this kind achieved the same result as a seriously ill patient. So how do these tricks with accounting arise? The companies communicate their health uh, to the external world using the financial statements. 
the users of the financial statements uh, mainly provide equity or debt financing to the companies. These are shareholders or banks. They analyze the information to make their decision whether to finance the company or not, whether to buy shares or sell, whether to provide loans or borrowings or not. They build certain expectations about the company's financial health, revenue, earnings, cash flows, et cetera, using these uh, financial statements. And the companies can either provide the information true and fair, or they can use uh, the tricks uh, to hide the truth. And today we will uh, discuss uh, several more accounting tricks that the companies often use to hide the truth uh, about their financial health. Uh, let's move on to why companies' management turns to creative accounting and think that they can really touch up the financial statements. We need to make one more input into our picture called checks and balances. So we all understand the importance of checks and balances when talking about functioning of a modern state. But whether the goal is preserving health state or upholding the integrity of financial reporting, a system of checks and balances is very important. It's paramount for preventing, uh, uncovering, unveiling, and punishing improper behavior. So I would also like to make one more input into the picture. The more investors the company can attract, the higher value uh, the shareholders get from selling the shares of this company. That's why the highest valuation the company can really get is the one from an IPO, or it sells to a big amount of smaller investors. And the more investors the company gets, the more important system of check, checks and balances is. It's, it's very easy to analyze. When you run a family business, uh, you may not need any independent directors, for example, or they can even damage your company. But when you sell the shares of your company to 1,000 small investors through an IPO, you can only meet their trust by implementing a very rigorous systems of checks and balances. So let's now talk on what checks and balances are usually not functioning well when the management starts to, to forge the, the financial statements. So what kind of uh, checks and balances uh, we usually have? First of all, we should look uh, at the company's senior executives. Are they members of the same family or are they close friends? Who is the CEO of the company? Is he powerful and bullying? Will he punish for winning at all costs, even by uh, making the financial statements fake. The next area of interest is the board of directors. Are they really qualified for the job or are they simply some celebrities brought to present the company? Are they really independent? And can they challenge the management uh, on, the most, on the most important questions, on related parties' transactions and for, on, on compensation plans? The next question is about auditors. How long uh, auditors stay with the company, with the same client? There is uh, always a golden mean of about five to six years the auditor should stay with the company and then uh, an auditor should be changed for, 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 for a fresh look uh, at the company's business and the company's financial statements. And finally, are there cases when the company tried to avoid public scrutiny? Uh, what is the history of the financial and accounting fraud of this company? So all these uh, elements of checks and balances are to be important and should be reviewed for warning signs uh, by, by an in investor. Uh, let us move uh, to our next case, 
uh, of creative accounting uh, from public companies. In, in this case, uh, we will discuss a company called Austal, which inflated its revenues for several years, uh, but they used a more sophisticated approach comparing to, to the first case we, we discussed with the fake sales through related parties of, of Luckin Coffee. Uh, this is a company, uh, this is a shipbuilding company producing ships uh, for both combat and commercial purposes. And you can see, uh, and this the clients of this company include uh, Australian Navy, Royal Navy Forces of Oman, and the United States Navy. So in December 2000, uh, 2010, the United States Navy uh, gave our Stahl a contract for construction uh, of two types of ships at their shipyard in, in the United States and Alabama. The first ships were combat ships, L LCS ships, and the second types of ships uh, were transportation vehicles. So you, you can see uh, the pictures of, of these ships uh, on the on the right side, on the right hand uh, of the slide. Uh, as you all understand, the construction of the ships uh, requires several years, and these are long-term contracts. How? Let's now let's discuss a little how the revenue should be recognized uh, for such long-term construction contracts. Uh, we have <clears throat> actually very two similar standards for accounting of revenue in IFRS 15 and USGAP ACS 606, which provide very detailed, but in my opinion, uh, quite high level of guidance for revenue accounting. Uh, but both standards require the revenue to be recognized when there is an actual transfer of goods or services to the client uh, in the amount of the consideration agreed between the parties. There is a widely known five-step model for revenue recognition, which requires to identify the contract first, identify the performance obligations to the contract, determine the transaction price, allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation, and finally recognize the revenue. And one of the key questions in accounting for long-term uh, contracts, the contracts which uh, actually last for more than one year, and in this case, these contracts lasted for several years, the key question is at what time recognize revenue from sales of the ships? Should the company recognize the revenue when they complete uh, the construction and transfer the ships to the customer? Or they're recognizing uh, the revenue based on percentage of completion of these ships. And actually the standards say uh, quite clearly that in this case, the revenue should be recognized based on percentage of completion uh, of a particular ship at each reporting period. So for example, if uh, the ship is completed, let's say, 20% uh, of completion, uh, you can recognize 20% of revenue at, at, at the uh, reporting period. So let's see uh, how the company uh, inflated its revenue on construction contracts. So Austal had annual budgeting process and the U US subsidiary was budgeted uh, with a certain amount of revenue and uh, earnings for, for each reporting period. And the trigger for the fraud, the trigger for publication of the financial statements in this case was the same. The revenue and uh, earnings EBIT was the key measure of the company profitability and what it was very closely reviewed by the analysts, by the analysts who analyzed the company's financial statements. So once the management, the United States management of the company understood that they couldn't deliver the budgeted amount of revenue, they started to cook the financial statements using 
uh, inflated uh, revenues they, using uh, artificially low percentage of completion uh, estimates. And uh, you can see uh, here that for each report, they, they did it for several years. And uh, here is a comparison uh, of the company's reported uh, earnings, uh, the analyst consensus about earnings. And you can see how small difference between the company's reported and expected earnings is. So company actually did everything to match uh, the analyst's expectation. And on the, on the right hand, you can see uh, what was the actual earnings and see how, how, how much difference, how big difference was between the actual and reported earnings. So let's see how, what the company actually did. So percentage of completion rate, ratio for each ship uh, is a result of division of the actual costs uh, to the estimate of the total costs for, for, for the ship. So you just take uh, the costs already incurred up to date, divide them by expected total costs and multiply it by, by the revenue under the contract. So estimated costs for each ship consisted of actual cost and forecast costs. And there were three main categories, material costs, uh, labor costs, and overheads. So soon after the construction, uh, after the start of construction of the first ship, the company's management understood that they made a big mistake in estimation they, uh, of the contract of, for construction. They underestimated cost of construction uh, using material and labor costs. First of all, uh, they budgeted, uh, they had to buy over twice of the amount of aluminum sheets for, for each uh, LCS ship than compared to initially budgeted. And they hugely, uh, they made a huge mistake in estimation of labor costs because it was difficult to find welders with experience of welding aluminum for, for the construction of the ship. So they incurred significant amount of costs uh, in education, in teaching the welders to weld the aluminum. So basically what the company did, uh, they showed wrong estimation of, of the costs uh, to, to, to complete the construction of, uh, of the ship. So, and they did it for several years uh, and actually, during that period, uh, during the, the, this, the, that period of time, the company's shares price tri tripled from uh, one almost one Australian dollar to 2.4 Australian dollars. So the, the company's management got huge bonuses. Uh, everybody was happy, but as you see at the end. Uh, the scheme was unveiled. The company had to show and had to report about its losses. And as a, in case with Luck and Coffee, there were numerous investigations, uh, court proceedings, criminal charges, et cetera, et cetera. So th this is not our point of interest uh, in this presentation. So, uh, now a little more of theoretical stuff. Uh, I have created a small roadmap of creative accounting so that uh, you can see uh, what are the key areas of creative accounting. Uh, it, it can be categorized in six basic areas. Uh, assets, liabilities, incomes, expenses, cash flows, and non-financial metrics. But of course, the, the most common area of creative accounting is income. Revenues are the key metrics reviewed by investors. Expectations about sales growth is where any analysis of the financial statements of a company starts with. So I, just a couple of weeks ago, I tried to compile uh, ways to inflate revenues for, for this webinar. Uh, and just within a couple of hours, 
uh, when I was writing an article, I, I easily came up with 17 easy, easy to find ways to inflate revenues, which I will tell you a little later. So you can imagine how many actual ways actually exist. In many cases, the companies try to understate expenses. This is usually done when the companies are okay with revenues, but not okay with net earnings. So these there are tricks with where this is where uh, the tricks with expenses actually start. I would say that liabilities are usually next in line because the companies often need to show less debt on their balance sheet than they really have. So there are multiple tricks to present less debt or interest-bearing borrowing, borrowings, leases, and even simple accounts payable. Then usually go with the assets. The major issues with assets uh, happen with overcapitalization of operating costs and lack of impairments. Cash flows and non-financial metrics are the most uncommon primary goals of accounting tricks. And therefore I would say that they're the most difficult actually to notice and, and to identify. <clears throat> so let's uh, talk a little about revenues. Uh, revenue represents recurring incomes of the business. Uh, for example, for construction company, these are sales of apartments, and for banks, for normal banks, uh, these are interest incomes from lenders, for example. Revenue should never be mixed with gains. Gains represent a one-off uh, gain for the business. For, for instance, for a construction company, Sale of apartments are revenues, while interest income, for example, from bank deposits are gains. On the contrary, for the bank, interest income is a recurring gain, while sale of apartments would mostly be an, a one-off event and should be presented as gains. So you can hardly imagine that bank uh, would trade uh, with apartments. As I mentioned before, it was easy for me to identify 17 potential tricks with revenues just within two couple two hours of work. So you can imagine how many actual tricks actually exist. Uh, is. So I have categorized those 17 ways in four types. Uh, first type is to record to record fake revenue. Um, this is the case with Luck and Coffee when the company uh, recorded uh, fake sales to related parties. But companies also, uh, also do it with butter sales. Uh, sometimes butter sales shouldn't be recognized at all. They do it with fake butter transactions, so called round trip transactions. And there are certain cases when the company show as revenues uh, something that should have been presented as lending transaction when they lend some someone uh, money or inventory. Sometimes company presented as a as a lending transaction, and I've seen such cases. The second type of fraud with revenues uh, is with. Uh, recording normal revenue at all stated amounts. So uh, this usually happens with uh, butter sales through inflated consideration. This was the case with Austal when the company uh, used inflated percentage of completion uh, re revenue. This open, often happens uh, with uh, agent principal uh, transactions. Sometimes company show the revenue on a gross basis when they actually should have presented it on net basis. Uh, there are multiple cases uh, with consolidation of companies, uh, of consolidation of subsidiaries or joint ventures, and th this is the Accelera case we will, which we'll, I will describe later. And sometimes these are more difficult cases with honor, onerous contracts. 
The third type of tricks is to record revenue too soon. Uh, this case can be the case with pull forwards, and we will talk about circle line case later. Uh, this is the case when the company recognized uh, one of big gains on long-term licensing on rental agreements uh, rather than spreading it evenly over the period of, of the agreement. Uh, Companies sometimes use bill and hold arrangements to, to inflate their revenue. So there are multiple ways to record revenue too soon. And finally, uh, the fourth type of transactions come with rec recording one of gains as revenue. So companies uh, sometimes uh, include into their revenues one of events which are not recurring. So sometimes it, it happens with disposal of non-current, sometimes with current assets, but still presenting a one-off event in your revenue is not correct and it, 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 it's against the rules. Let's see what are, let's briefly see what are cases with, when primary goal of creative accounting is to, to, to decrease uh to understate the expenses i also brought it down in in four types uh the first type is simply hide the expenses it's it's it can be very simple you just don't uh record uh for example invoice from your supplier leave them off balance sheets uh, use some aggressive accounting assumptions or just play with reserves. So you just hide expenses or losses from your income statement, from your profit and loss. The second approach, the second type is to shift expenses to later periods. Uh, it's, it's also a very common case when companies capitalize normal operating expenses. For example, they have a, they have a lot of marketing costs. They understand that uh, in this period they may face losses and they just capitalize marketing costs on a balance sheet, calling them some prepayments, some marketing assets, et cetera, et cetera. Companies also sometimes, in a lot of times, fail to impair assets. This is also a very common case when the companies do not impair the, the loss-making assets, the loss-making cash-generating units at a proper time, period of time. So the first two types uh, relate when to, to the situations when the company tried to uh, hide expenses or shift expenses to later periods, while the third and the fourth type uh, show the cases when the companies are very profitable in the current reporting period, they understand they are doing well, but at the same time, uh, due, for example, to deteriorating market conditions, they expect that they may incur losses in the next reporting period, so they uh, bring more expenses to the current reporting period so that the next uh, year, the next quarter, the next half year would be much more profitable. So uh, they once again play with reserves, uh, they write off assets at the, at, at the wrong period of time, or they shift current income to, to, to later periods. So once again, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, judgment to be made when you account for your provisions, for your reserves. And there are uh, also two very difficult uh, and complex technically areas of accounting when you account for derivatives uh, and when you account for business combinations, so-called acquisition accounting. So th that's all with theory. Let's move on to, to the uh, three smaller cases, to the last three smaller cases of creative accounting. The first case is a case of Struga line where the company uh, used creative accounting, used pull forwards uh, to bring more revenue into current reporting period. 
This company was formerly known as RTI Surgical, and they manufacture implants for spinal and orthopedic, orthopedic uh, implants. So the trigger, once again, was market expectation, uh, market uh, analysts' expectation related to revenue, and of course, the management remuneration, which was linked uh, to, 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 to revenues. So the scheme was orchestrated for several years by the company's uh, CFO. So uh, once again, uh, revenue is to be recorded when um, there is a transfer of risks and rewards between the seller and the customer, when there is a transfer of control uh, from the seller to the customer. So the company uh, used pull forwards for four years when uh, they shipped the orders from the customers uh, before the customers even originally requested them. So they pulled future sales uh, forward to, to the current period because they understood that they lacked uh, revenue in, in, the, in the current period because they had revenue shortfalls. In some instances, uh, they did so after requesting and obtaining customer permission. In other instances, Sorgoline shipped orders early without even customer's approval and recognized uh, revenue for the sales uh, when, when, when they shipped the, the goods. So uh, the practice in the company was so common that members of the Sulga Line senior management discussed opportunities for pull forwards just during their normal uh, staff meetings. So they, when they needed additional revenue, they just uh, asked, uh, called the commercial director, call, called the commercial division to identify additional potential pull forwards, discuss specific customers, and just and in, even in sometimes approved discounts to induce customers to, to accept early shipments. So all the recognition criteria for revenue were breached. Uh, sales were not made uh, in accordance with an arrangement with the customers. Uh, delivery was not made because sometimes the customer didn't take uh, the, the control, the, the, the risks and rewards of ownership of, of the products. And finally, the price uh, of sales was not fixed and was not determined because they, the management of the company discussed and finalized the, the final discounts with the customers for the early shipments much later after, after, after delivery and the recognition of sales in their books. So once again, there was uh, a long investigation of, SEC, of the Security and Exchange Commission, there were court proceedings, uh, there were criminal charges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And actually, the company uh, later had to even rename itself uh, from RTI Surgical to Sugaline Holdings. Uh, our next case, uh, uh, which which I would like to present, is a case when the company deliberately consolidated another company without even any right for it. So it, it's ways, it's uh, acquisition accounting and accounting for business co combinations. It's it's quite complex area in the financial reporting. So there are much more complex cases. But for, for the sake of this presentation, I, I, I tried to find a case where the fake consolidation is so obvious that it will be very easy to present how the company did it. It's a case of Accelera Innovations. So some information about the case. Uh, Accelera Innovations uh, is also a US-based company. It was uh, found in April 2008 as a shell company. In 2013, the company purchased uh, another company, a behavioral healthcare associates. It's a healthcare provided in the United States. 
According to the uh, share port purchase agreement, uh, Accelera had to pay uh, $1 million uh, as consideration within 90 days after closing and the rest $4.6 million they had to pay in installments over time. And actually the, the Accelera never made any payments under the agreements. But despite never making any of the payment and despite that they actually did not have any control over the company. They consolidated uh, behavioral healthcare associates for almost three years and provided uh, the consolidated financial statements, uh, which included the subsidiary to the uh, regulator in the United States for three years. So when uh, the SEC started the investigation. They found out that uh, Accelera never made any management decisions for behavioral. They never controlled its bank accounts, never supervised the CEO of the company, never decided on his salary, uh, never directed any day-to-day -day operations of the company and received uh, any of the company's revenue. So actually, they did not have control over the company. So it was a fully fake uh, consolidation just to show a uh, higher balance sheet, higher consolidated revenues, and, and of course, net earnings. So by consolidating behavioral financial statements, Accelera overstated its revenues by 90% in, in 2013 and 2014. So once again, it was a very obvious, a very easy to understand case when the company made used fake consolidation to, to present better results uh, to the investors. Thank you very much for your attention. We have one final case. Uh, it's uh, it's, it's also very small, it's, it's very obvious. It deals with overstated consideration on, on acquisition. It's, it, it can be, very, acquisition accounts and can be very sophisticated, but in this case, it, it was very obvious. So it will, easy, it will be easy to describe. So we have a company called Canavest, which acquired in 2013, another company called Pitosphere Systems. Uh, the purchase price was 35 million US dollars. Uh, Canavest paid uh, almost $1 million in cash, and the rest was uh, paid by issuance of uh, Canavest stock. But the problem was that at the time of purchase, Canavest stock didn't trade on any active market. So the trading volume was very small and the price was very volatile. So the company just uh, inflated the uh, consideration on acquisition. They just overpriced their own uh, shares. So they actually, when uh, these, uh, case was unveiled, uh, the company uh, had to uh, impair almost uh, $27 million of their goodwill, which they recognized uh, as a result of the acquisition. So the whole trick was to uh, overstate the company's consolidated assets. They did it and they used uh, inflated acquisition price uh, in the accounting, in their consolidated financial statements. So this is a very obvious, very simple uh, case uh, where the company tricked uh, with acquisition accounting and overstated their consideration uh, on acquisition. Uh, that's all. That's the end. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think I, I have inflated my time uh, for this pre presentation, but I'm still within one hour. So thank you very much for, for your time and attention. I have presented a very limited amount of cases, a very limited number of cases. Uh, I have some more cases in my articles on LinkedIn. 
so you can read them later. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your time. I'll be very glad to your feedback. And of course, uh, my company and myself are always glad uh, to assist you on uh, your complex accounting situation, your complex accounting uh, cases, and uh, of course, on automation of uh, almost any area of your uh, finance in your company. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Goodbye.